part because that's a special kind of stupid arrogance that we still have here in the United States. And Columbus and his big ass Cadillac of a boat today. You can't like go over to your neighbor's yard by right of discovery and plant your family flag there and be like, this shit's mine. It's a gross foundation. So here's the thing, like that's one of the things we're gonna debunk in this myth is America, is like from the foundation on, the whole thing's been highly suspect and highly questionable, yet tells us so much about who we are today. Syphilis was brought back to Europe because the Spanish were so freaking rapey. But I will straight up say they are hopped up on Catholicism and they believe what they're doing is okay. Welcome to a new project for the Revolution and Ideology podcast. What we're doing uh, with this new project here alongside our other stuff on Stateless Society that you all can listen to is we're also creating this new series called Myth is America, where we take the history of the United States and deconstruct it. The idea is to tell history, a critical history of, of course, uh, the architects of the nation through more or less modern times, but also... Uh, to unearth the voices of those who have been subjugated and suppressed. And so we're going to have numerous, uh, or at least we hope to have numerous guest speakers speaking on topics uh, from, of course, race relations to feminism to all these other other important things, these voices that have been suppressed in American history. So it's not necessarily going to be fully groundbreaking in comparison to the works of like a Howard Zinn or an Edward Said or something like that, some of those more important post-structural historians. But what we're hoping to do is to make it a little bit more digestible in here, uh, or through this podcast, I guess I should say. So uh, I'm going to start with the uh, the same saying I say in my classes when I do this uh, deconstructionist history, or some would might even say revisionist history in a sort of a negative connotation, and and they can feel that way. That's cool. They're protecting their status, but regardless is nothing of any consequence comes from a place of comfort and some of the things that we're going to talk about in here are likely to make some listeners uncomfortable because we are we are going to critique basically the traditional celebrated narrative of the United States we're going to pick it apart uh this first episode is pretty much going to focus on uh the Christopher Columbus story um and it's not that controversial anymore of all of the myths that we are going to kind of debunk or deconstruct in this podcast this might be the one that's already kind of popularly known uh there's numerous youtube videos on it some of them are pretty funny adam ruins everything and so on and so forth but Regardless, we still feel compelled as like kind of the jumping off point that we've all been conditioned to believe in that we should at least start here and then we can do some more controversial topics that might be a little bit um, lesser known for the audience. So uh, without further ado, we're going to kick this thing off. And real quick, we forgot the intro. So I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And uh, what do you got to add right off the bat, Nick? What do you think of what we're going to be doing with this Myth is America project? Yeah, I'm super excited just to dive right in. And I've heard a lot of these lectures in our classes together. So I'm excited just to put them out there in the world for public consumption. So um, our students get this now. Everyone can, I guess. Yeah, it's going to be cool. And and we're not going to approach it like like we would necessarily full-blown like lecture like we would in maybe a, a, a classroom. It's going to be, you know, I'm going to throw some information out there. We'll read from primary sources. And uh, Nick's going to respond and provide us with the wildly important sociological view on things. So uh, let's get started. Let's get, get started with this, uh, this Columbus thing. So what we have to do is kind of set the context for what's going on. Most of us all know that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 because there's a cool rhyme about it and uh, maybe we even performed a play or something along those lines. And we all know about the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria, all those things that we remember from our childhood uh, when we maybe did a worksheet or a coloring coloring book on them in whatever kindergarten, first grade, who knows. But what I want to do is set the context for why. Why did the Spaniards end up here Uh, in North and South America anyway. What was the point of this? Well, if we look around the world in the 1400s, there's some important things going on. And I'll focus mostly on on Europe at this exact moment. The mid-1400s saw a quote-unquote rebirth of sorts. Uh, It's more fondly known in history as the Renaissance, and most people are aware it kind of gets going in Italy. Some say in Florence, I would argue that that Siena, another city-state, played a crucial role in that as well, but it doesn't really matter. 
And one of the reasons the Renaissance started was because of the uh, wealth that the Italian city-states were garnering from more or less holding a trade monopoly in parts of the Mediterranean. Um, and that trade not just brought them wealth and goods, but most importantly, coming into contact with other societies that, to be blunt, were at the time exponentially more advanced than Europe in certain ways in math, in medicine, uh, in astronomy, things like that, um, to include like kingdoms in Mali um, or uh, the Islamic empires, especially, of course, the Ottoman at that point are rising to prominence. It gave them knowledge. It gave them ideas. It gave them new perspectives. We also have to keep in mind that that through the 1400s, there were various uh, crusades, although none as famous as the, the first couple in the 11th century, but there were still some fizzling out crusades uh, that were taking place all the way through the early 1400s. The only reason those later ones are even relevant is, again, these are people from Europe going to other places and finding that some of these other places have cool things and, in certain ways, are arguably a little bit smarter than us. So we're going to take some of these ideas back uh, from these other places, and it's going to lead to somewhat of a rebirth. The irony here is it's called a rebirth because some of the knowledge that they are exhuming at this time was originally European anyway, or at least maybe it was Greek or Roman, and for a long period of time the church had been uh, suppressing that knowledge. And the fact that uh, specifically the Islamic empires had preserved it and then improved upon it is actually kind of interesting. So it's, some of it is like, you know, again, ancient Greek and Roman knowledge that had been suppressed, preserved, advanced upon in places like the Middle East or Northern Africa, and then brought back to Europe. Anyway, all that means to say is the Italian city-states were able to use both the material, ideal, and intellectual uh, exchange of things that were going on at the time to start to advance again. And one of the byproducts of this is a new uh, angle on material culture. They began to basically show this off. I mean, we have major artistic projects, maybe major cultural projects. And if we look at like Da Vinci, even some scientific exploration, um, which was going on at the time. And when you start seeing these things produce, eventually you get things, well, I mean, yeah, you start getting wonderful paintings and new perspectives and a rise in humanism and eventually a rise even in commodification with the rise of the Medici and Florence and their banking guild and uh, starting to manufacture currency, the florin. All of these things for other Europeans derived or derived was indicative of a rising status of these Italian city-states. And these other European entities all wanted to begin to have some of this, to compete with the Italian city-states. And they saw that one of the ways that the Italian city-states were becoming so successful in this regard was their trade networks. So, um, yeah, this competition for status led to uh, exploring other ways to get cool stuff in other parts of the world. Now, most of us know that one of the things that they really wanted to get, or one of the things, some of the things they really wanted to get were from the Far East. And they needed to figure out a way to get there. Now, again, we all remember from kindergarten it was silks and spices, but why silks and spices? Silks and spices are commodities. They're not necessities. We don't need them. It's not food, water. If we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they're not necessarily like super needed, but we want them. They are desirable and they are signs of status. And that's what people were competing over at the time with status. Well, for these other entities that might not have had access to these Eastern goods or commodities, uh, they needed to find another way to get there. So, that's what's going to take us to Iberia, uh, which would be the Spanish and Portuguese kingdoms. Now, the Spanish uh, is who we're going to focus on, but real quickly, uh, I want to just mention that the Portuguese also, in a way, beat the Spanish to the punch for finding one way to get to the east. See, the Portuguese and the Spanish were also engaged during this time of one of the last crusades, a crusade that doesn't even make it to the Middle East. It's just a crusade in Iberia that's meant to, quote-unquote, purge all of the non-believers from, uh, from, the, from the peninsula. Some call it uh, the Reconquista. Um, there were elements of the Spanish Inquisition uh, there as well. But basically, if you were a non-Catholic follower at the time, so in Spain, it would have been uh, a large population of Muslims because of prior conquests dating all the way back to the 7th and 8th century, or a pretty sizable minority of Jews as well, Sephardim Jews. Anyway, the Reconquista uh, and eventually the Inquisition leads to the persecution, um, oppression, and sometimes torture of these individuals, and sometimes just outright just killing of these individuals or forceful uh, removal of these individuals. A lot of them find their ways of uh, being pushed into North Africa, and the Portuguese lead the charge into North Africa. They eventually, of course, keep moving 
uh, through North Africa, and eventually they find that there are some kingdoms uh, the further south they go, especially once they get through the Sahara, that used to be, of course, the, the grandiose kingdoms of Mali and before them Ghana. And they see wealth, they see riches, and it piques their interest. At this time, they're also starting to circumnavigate the west coast of Africa and noting some very important things uh, there as well, that they can exchange some of their more refined goods for raw materials and sometimes even human beings. This is important because the Portuguese are the ones that are going to be responsible for starting the transatlantic slave trade. That's not for this episode, uh, but I'm going to make uh, uh, mention of it right now so that we can remember for future episodes. It is the Portuguese during this time that begin to set up these trade networks along the west coast that eventually would found the transatlantic slave trade. Anyway, they keep circumnavigating the west coast of Africa, eventually round the Cape of Good Hope, Vasco da Gama, makes it to India, and they are successful. The reason I emphasize that is that's one more route that is cut off for the Spanish. They can't necessarily compete in the Mediterranean because of the Italians, and they can't necessarily compete going south because the Portuguese have now a stranglehold on the west coast of Africa. So one more solution that the Spanish in particular might be looking for is, hey, what if we go overland through uh, basically Eurasia. Well, there's a problem there. There's a major empire in between them and the East. It is the Ottoman Empire. And that might not be a huge issue if they had a good relationship with the Ottoman Empire, but they did not. And part of that was because of their Reconquista. See, the Ottoman Empire was an Islamic empire, uh, Sunni Muslim to be exact at that moment in time. But here's the thing. One of the things that all Muslims are are supposed to do, is, as, as outlined by the Prophet Muhammad in both Hadith and the Quran, is uh, uh, support and protect the Ummah, which is the community of believers. Well, long story short, if the Spanish are part of the persecution of Muslims in Spain, they are harming elements of the Ummah, which hurts their relationship, of course, with an Islamic empire. So the Ottoman Empire is not necessarily going to do them any favors uh, to help them get the things they want. So they can't go over land, they can't go through the Mediterranean, they can't go south through Africa. We all know they're going to try and do something uh, else. They're going to end up trying to go west to get east and uh, quote-unquote prove the world is round, although that's not really a thing. But before I keep going, I've, I've talked for a little bit on this context. Any I, any thoughts on this? This this. I mean, there's a lot of depth there I skipped, but this isn't a European podcast. I'm just trying to get us to, to North America here. No, I mean, I think it's key, obviously, yeah. that we emphasize the fact that the journey took place. It was capitalistic in nature. I mean, it's seeking resources. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we would call it, I mean, proto-capitalism or some even say like a mercantilist thing that they're going to set up first. But yeah, it's all along that trajectory towards trying to create a, a capitalist enterprise and, and get these commodities and profit from them and then sh take the profit to use to show off their status through grandiose works and so on and so forth. And the fact that the reason Columbus had to go to Spain is key because I think this is often skipped in definitely like the K-12 through education system. Mm-hmm. It's rarely even mentioned that, like, he was funded by Spain, and it makes, you know what I mean? Yeah. He was Italian. And it yeah, I was going to say, for those that don't know, he was Italian, but I think a lot of people at this point know that, that the debunking of Columbus, he was from Genoa, but but yeah. The, it's actually kind of cool that, that, I mean, not cool, but let's just say, like, his experience of being in a, a trade-heavy society from Italy probably helped his sales pitch, uh, quote-unquote, to Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. Mm -hmm. Anyway... We know what's going to happen. He is going to uh, perform this sales pitch and argue, hey, you want this shit in the east? I can tell you how to get there. You go west. You're going to end up in the things in the east. But here's one of the things that, that most people know uh, and it has been predominantly debunked is – he didn't prove the world was round. His goal was not to prove the world was round. More or less, the vast majority of, of intelligent civilizations at that point in time, I guess that's a loaded term, but whatever, they knew the world was round. They knew the world was round, right? The Chinese dynasties knew the world was round. The ancient Greeks knew the world was round. Not only did they know the world was round, they knew it went around the sun. They knew about heliocentrism. The Muslim empires knew, of course, the world was round. Native Americans, even in their mythology, knew the world was round. So in your opinion, why do we tell this complete nonsense story to our youngest, most impressionable uh, uh, citizens as we're like forming them? Like he proved the world was round. What the hell are we getting out of basically lying straight face to these kids? Well, I mean, some people today don't know the world is round. So. Yeah, I know. That, that. I mean, hey, go flat earthers. Do your thing. Do your thing. No, I mean, I think the reason is very obvious. We're trying to give as much background and support to this myth as absolutely possible to celebrate the narrative that a white man discovered, quote unquote, like the biggest air quotes I can possibly have, discovered America. 
and discovered this, that the world was round, like discovered all of these things. And he didn't discover a damn thing. So what are we trying to reproduce by with through this lie, right? Like this is this is a blatant lie. So even if kids later find out that they were lied to, no one's losing their shit. No one's like freaking out. Oh my god, they lied to me. They don't make the connection. What else could they be lying about? That's what we're going to do in this podcast. But regardless, wh- like what's the point though? Like what's the point? What is the receiver of this information supposed to do? We know why the state wants to legitimize it. Yeah, white dudes know a lot of things, and they they're they're go getters or whatever. Fine. I mean it's functioning to subjugate the populations that were already here in the land the the fact that other people all of them whom weren't white already long ago knew that the earth was round and the way that the galaxy functioned and etc it's subjugating all of those knowledges it's exactly what it's doing and here's one of the big ones that 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 made me just think of it popularizes the idea that he made this like amazing voyage that was you know he had to go through these hardships and it makes him look like more of a hero when in reality what he did uh based on historical evidence wasn't all that impressive we already know for example about four or five hundred years earlier the norse were already in north america they had made that journey so again that's not super i'm not blowing minds there most people know that the vikings or very people that we call the vikings had already been here but here's one that, that often gets overlooked polynesian wayfarers from the east actually had sailed or i don't even know if the word is sailed but had made it across the pacific which is way bigger and way more uh uh, tenuous ocean than the atlantic and they did this thousands of years ago and that's part of the part of the indigenous population of central and south america are these polynesian wayfarers and probably a whole host of other groups not necessarily from polynesia they had made a much more important journey but if we emphasize the columbus one it as just nick said kind of subjugates that knowledge it, it, it makes whatever these other people did before that before him much less impressive or it's not even it's not even that it's not impressive we just flat out ignore it it Which, didn't even by the happen. way like if you just look up images of ships that existed in Columbus's era and then look up the – in Oslo, there's a Viking ship museum. Just If you're on a computer right now, just Google that and look at the images of the ships they have there. They have two main ones. And just think about that the Norse made that navigation in those types of boats and think about how much more impressive that is than Columbus and his – Big ass Cadillac of a boat making that journey. Yeah, and if we remember, we'll link. Uh, Ted Ed actually uh, has a pretty sweet uh, uh, episode or teaching thing on Polynesian wayfarers and why they were so good at what they did. And you can get a an image of their boats and the ways they were able to navigate. So if we remember, we'll link that in in the description or or down below. Um, so yeah. Anyway. We know what happens. We know what happens. Uh, Columbus eventually is going to to make this journey, and he's going to take the three boats that we all at one point in, in our lives had to memorize. He's going to, uh, of course, find his way across the Atlantic. Here's one thing that actually I will say less people knew. Even if most of the world knew the world was round, they uh, less people knew that there were two big-ass continents here. That That is true. And, of course, we know that Columbus measurements were off. We he, we know he thought the world was much smaller than it really is. And he certainly did not know that there were two continents uh, that were going to be in the way of his making it to China. Of course, the, the great irony, he has a letter to the great Khan. He's going to, to, to set up this great trade relationship with the dynasty at the time. But anyway, he thinks he's off. He knows he's off when he ends up here. And, of course, this is also now kind of common knowledge, not blowing minds here. He thinks he missed by ending up in India and ends... Hence, the people, of course, he begins to meet end up being called Indians. And, of course, we know we don't use that term anymore, but that's that's where this kind of gets started. But I want to focus on what happens when he actually lands. Again, the journey itself is a tough uh, – I suppose it's a tough journey by like our modern standards. But again, historically speaking, based on what the, the Vikings were able to accomplish and the Polynesian wayfarers were able to accomplish or even the people that walked across the Bering Strait, the journey was not – not that, not that bad. So we shouldn't, you know, necessarily make a big deal about it. Um, here's something though. He lands in San Salvador, right? That's the savior. That's what it means. It means the savior. And the people he meets are actually what we would call Taino Arawak. Um, and there are, of course, different sub clans, but we don't know as much as we'd like to about these indigenous people that he meets throughout the Caribbean and everything we should know, honestly, about the way their, their society worked and, uh, functioned because, uh, the ethnic cleansing campaign that he started, uh, it was so complete. It was so complete, um, that we have very little, 
uh, uh, source work to go with on this. We don't really have any Taino source work to the best of my knowledge. All we have is Spanish source work on this. So again, it's not super descriptive that would help us really outline who this group of people were and their complete reception and impression of at first Columbus's arrival and then what happens with the establishment of, of conquest and domination thereafter. Um, anyway, what I'd like to do to kind of kick things off regarding his landing here as we go through is to read from Christopher Columbus's diary. Uh, his, one of the entries, one of the earliest entries, Thursday 11th, Thursday the 11th of October in 1492. And I'm not going to read the, uh, the entire entry. I basically, I'm going to do what I would do in a class uh, rather than just read to students, which would get super boring. I basically just go through like some highlights of what he had to say. And I'm going to do the same here. So this is, um, uh, again, Thursday the 11th of October, 1492. This is what we have. The admiral called down to the two captains and to the others who had jumped ashore and to Rodrigo de Escobedo, the Escrivano, which means clerk, of the whole fleet, and to Rodrigo Sanchez de Sogovia, and he said that they should be witness that in the presence of all he would take, as in fact he did take, possession of the said island for the king and for the queen his lords, making the declarations that were requited, required excuse me, and which at more length are contained in the testimonials made there in writing. I'm going to pause on just this first quote I pulled out of this like early entry in 1492 from his diary first and foremost like a little bit of the third person there whether he was arrogant or someone else was writing for him that's always funny to me that he says the admiral like he's talking about himself um but at any rate the first thing this guy does is he sees a new place and he knows people are there he sees the people there because we find out later he sees the people there and he just claims it that is an absurd amount of arrogance how can you do that yeah, I mean, I don't even know what to say. It's asshole. I don't, yeah. but, but, but what is it about, so what I want to draw from our ideologies class, what is it about his ideology that makes that acceptable? That's what I really want to pick apart because that's a special kind of stupid arrogance that we still have here in the United I States. I mean, it's white European exceptionalism is exactly okay. what it is. Yeah. yeah. Think about it. And, and again, what I like to use when I'm talking about this in class, think about it. We went to a new place in 1969, and the first thing we did is we planted our flag on it. Right? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, but we didn't bring like the world flag up there. We brought a United States flag up there, planted it on the moon, and basically this is, this shit is mine. Like somehow celebrating our exceptional accomplishment. And Columbus is merely like a forerunner to that type of mentality. That is a, like again, you couldn't get away with that. I also think like there's huge undercurrents of nationalism here. We wouldn't say that in Columbus's era we see full-blown nationalism. Obviously, we do with the moon and the American flag. But the fact that he claims it for the crown is saying something also politically and socially about the time and how they think of the world. But you can't pull this off today. You can't like go over to your neighbor's yard by right of discovery and plant your family flag there and be like, this shit's mine, regardless of the fact that you're here. Like, why do we – we ignore these like little details like that. We just, just – and I think like just by – glossing it over and being like just kind of stating it matter of fact and not really dissecting it we end up reproducing that mentality of that's okay in our society today oh man we can just go places where people clearly live and plant a flag and say this shit's mine also by ignoring that aspect of the story like you just mentioned it completely reinforces the narrative of the time that like the people that were there were quote unquote uncivilized and the white european that found this land was yeah. somehow had a right to it because of who they were, et cetera. Which that is divine obvious or royal or national right or whatever it is. And again, this is a part of the foundational story of a nation state right now that has bases in countless countries with American flags flying over them. What kind of arrogant shit is that? We would lose our minds if Italy just showed up one day and we're like, we're going to build an, uh, a, a military base right outside of New York City because we can. We would lose our minds. And yet we still do that shit. Mm -hmm. So again, we can kind of see it right here. Uh, a special kind of arrogance. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. Anyway, moving on. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about what he had to say. We're going to skip ahead a couple of days to Saturday, the 13th of October, 1492. Once, of course, we realize that there are humans here, which again, he saw from the very beginning. It's not like the Taino were hiding. They, they were out on the, uh, they were, they were out on the coast. They were an island people. They, of course, lived by the ocean. Uh, they fished, all of those things. So again, it wasn't a surprise that people were there. It was a wildly populous, uh, island, which again, I guess I didn't say San Salvador, also Hispaniola, which is the modern day nation states of what we would call Haiti and Dominican Republic is where he landed. 
Anyway, we find out that he was attentive. He says, I was attentive and labored to find out if there was any gold. And I saw that some of them wore little pieces hung in a hole that they have in their noses. So he's not going to get, he already knows based on the lay of the land, he's not going to get the silk and spices he thinks he's going to have. But of course, the next best thing would be precious metals. So he's going to look for precious metals. He also makes this observation as he begins to engage with the people. He says, and these people are very gentle. And because of their desire to have some of our things and believing that nothing will be given to them without their giving something and not having anything, they take what they can and then throw themselves into the water to swim. Now, he doesn't understand what the hell is going on here, but what is that called? What, what are the Taino engaging in with these visitors? It's reciprocity. Yeah, and which was common among indigenous societies all around the world, right? Reciprocity. You meet new people or you want to make friends with people. There is constant gift giving and you're, you're making bonds and those bonds are revealed. It doesn't matter like the value of the gift itself. It's whatever you have, you exchange because there is no commodified value attached to it. It's the act of giving and receiving that creates these bonds. So basically the Taino are welcoming the Spaniards at this point and basically trying to include them in their group. Like you are visitors. You have cool different things that we've never seen before. We also have some things for you. Let's get along. Um, he doesn't pick up on that. He's like, ah, oh, they just want our stuff. Okay. We also find out uh, on the next day, Sunday the 14th of October, that they throw themselves into the sea swimming and came to us. And we understand that they were asking us if we had come from the heavens. Now, this is a super important point. If the Taino uh, Arawak had, in fact, thought that these were some sort of deities or aliens or whatever, if they had come from somewhere else, that is something that Columbus can use, Right. The fact that he wrote this down shows that this is something that you can use to manipulate people, right? They, if you th if they are presenting themselves as thinking of you as like higher already just because you came with new things wearing like, you know, whatever, metal metal shirts that they'd never seen before and have sticks that go boom and 20 yards away something falls and dies, that, that would be something that would fall into the mythology. The other thing I like to focus on when I talk about this is... We don't need to know what an alien apocalypse would look like through our sci-fi movies. We've already seen this play out. This, for the Taino, is an alien apocalypse, right? Their culture, of course, was based on reciprocity, sustainability, or at least we can assume those things because they were island people. They show up with a quote-unquote technologically superior, though morally bankrupt society. That ends up showing up, and I am clear, a morally bankrupt society shows up with superior technology. They don't care about the Taino. Although I want to emphasize that the reason they have the superior technology is because they're morally bankrupt. Right. A the reason they invented weapons that can are so efficient at killing people is because of that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, we know that they're going to be able to use this to their advantage. And an even a better example, which we're not going to get to today, it, kind of, it just kind of goes with the whole topic, but I won't be specific. Cortez does the same thing a, a few years later, but is about a decade and a half later, when he ends up in uh, the mainland of what we would call now Mexico, he basically is able to play off the fact that he appears to be, I believe it's Quetzalcoatl, war god. Uh, eventually, the, uh, the, the Mexica or the Aztecs stop believing him, but initially he's able to use that to take advantage of the people that greet him on the coast. Um, anyway, this is, and I want to focus on this, the same entry. So we're still Sunday, October 14th. It has been three days, three days since he's officially been on the island. And it took him three days to come to this conclusion. This is wildly important. Except that whenever your highness may command, all of them can be taken to Castile or he held captive in the same island because with 50 men, all of them could be held in subjection and can be made to do whatever one might wish. It took him three days of experiencing life with these people to realize that I can hold them in subjection and make them do whatever I want. I can make them slaves. It took him three days. Why was that where his mind went so quickly? Like, again, you went on this amazing journey. You proved a whole bunch of people wrong, whatever. Let, let's pretend like we're going to make him into this glorious guy. But in three days, what's wrong with this guy's mentality? Um, that that was, the, that was one of the first things he thought of. I mean, his whole focus is conquest and exploitation. That, that's the whole reason for the journey from Columbus's perspective. You know what I mean? So why don't we emphasize that? Because I'm going to do it again in a later episode when we do this Virginia Company nonsense and we debunk that mythology. But right off the bat, like the foundational story of the Americas, not just the United States in this case, but all of the Americas, is the foundation is based on exploitation, subjection, and slavery. 
that is not a good start, but we don't focus on that. Yeah, it's problematic for the freest country on earth that it was founded on exploitation, intentional exploitation and murder, subjection of an entire group of people that then continued for hundreds of years, still continues to this day. That's who we are. Yeah. That's who we are. He goes on to say, uh, this is the next day on Monday, October 15th. He says, nevertheless, it was my, uh, my intention was not to pass by any island of which I did not take possession. Although it, if it's taken of one, it may be said that it was taken of all. Of course, he continues to explore the rest of the Caribbean. It's a little bit easier to do that. And he begins to take all of these islands and rinse and repeat the same model. Anyway, we're going to stop reading for Columbus now because uh, he sucks. And we're going to now read from a priest that shows up a little bit later on one of the later journeys and then ends up staying there for the better part of uh, four decades. We're going to read from Bartolome de las Casas. And for those that have taken my class before, people know that he's, he's, he's a favorite source of mine. Now, it doesn't mean he's like a, a, a saint himself. He had interesting views on African slavery, uh, which he changed over the course of his life. But again, he's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But it is important to note that once he experienced what was really going on in the Caribbean, instead of just going with the, the flow, just being part of the problematic process of ethnic cleansing, which is what he was seeing, he actually called it out. I'll, 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 uh, he learned from another priest uh, that's not quite as famous, Antonio Montesinos. And I'll quote a favorite movie of mine called uh, Even the Rain or Tambian La Luvia. Uh, basically, these uh, priests were the first voices of conscience against uh, an empire. Um, and so, again, they were at first with the program, but once they saw what was actually happening, they became, quote-unquote, boots on the ground. They began to call the Spanish conquistadors and the crown all out on their bullshit. And so the first one we're going to read from is The Devastation of the Indies, a brief account that he wrote in 1542, so exactly 50 years after Columbus's first voyage, and I want to say about 40 years after De Las Casas showed up. Okay, this is what De Las Casas had to say. He says, And of all the infinite universe of humanity, these people, he's talking about the Taino, or the surviving Taino at this point, are the most guileless, the most devoid of wickedness and duplicity, the most obedient and faithful to their native masters and to the Spanish Christians whom they serve. They are by nature the most humble, patient, and peaceable, holding no grudges, free from embroilment, neither excitable nor quarrelsome. These people are the most devoid of rancors, hatreds of desire, hatreds or desire for vengeance of any people in the world. And because they're so weak and complacent, they are less able to do it, endure heavy labor and soon die of no matter what malady. Well, one thing is, yes, they were forced into uh, slavery and, and, and they were worked to death. But one thing that uh, 16th century writers probably also were not fully aware of or could not fully articulate was that disease was also wreaking havoc. And, and we know that that's not a shock to any listener. But I think we overblow uh, the idea that disease was like the main problematic element of the conquest. Like it's almost like it rationalizes it for us. Like, yeah, maybe a couple people did some bad things when they showed up here. But really no one can help the fact that the diseases are the real reason that so many indigenous people died. And that's completely letting the colonizers off the hook, whether we're talking about the Spanish or eventually when we get to uh, the United States, the British settlers. Like that is completely letting them off the hook. Um, and again, that's rationalization. Why do we rationalize it that way? It's, it's gross. Yeah, I mean, it's because, like you said, it lets people off the hook. If they didn't know about germs and they didn't happen to be immune from the diseases that the Europeans brought, then it wasn't really the Europeans' fault. They didn't know. When you know that's not the case. They were dying because they were enslaved. And spoiler alert, a life of slavery is not that doesn't, conducive to Doesn't anything. build the immune system. No, doesn't exactly. build the immune system. Yeah. And we also, of course, when we get to uh, some British sources, again, not in this episode, but future episodes, we actually find out that they did learn and they started to inoculate uh, uh, blankets. And again, that's not just like hearsay, like they talked about it. So we will be getting to that in, in future episodes. So they began to, to basically uh, commit themselves to biological warfare as well, which, again, it's a gross foundation. So here's the thing. Like that's one of the things we're going to debunk in this myth is America is like from the foundation on – the whole thing's been highly suspect and highly questionable, yet tells us so much about who we are today. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to keep picking this apart. Okay. He also find, we also find out from De Las Casas that they are also a poor people. For they not only possess little, but have no desire to possess worldly goods. 
that's such an important like line right in there. Like again, this guy comes in and he makes this observation that they're poor. He might not have a better. And again, this is translated from Spanish, so I'm not even sure how great the translation is into English. But regardless, his observation is that they are poor. He doesn't have a better word for it, and yet he also makes this statement: they're poor because they don't want to have things. That's very important. That shows a, a that that when we get to this point of contact between Europeans and indigenous people in the Americas and eventually in other parts of the world as well, it's not that just there was miscommunication because these groups of people spoke a different language. They had completely different value systems, completely different ideologies, and completely different ways of living. Right, one was based on sustainability and reciprocity. Um, it doesn't mean it was like some of the utopian. Everyone's like holding hands and singing kumbaya. They had conflict, but even the conflict was reciprocal in ways. Um, and I must stress this: the Europeans are not like this at, 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 anymore. Basically, Western civilization at this point is insatiable. It operates under the ideology of more that you can never be satisfied, which is disgusting on multiple levels. Um, but we'll come to examples of that as they rear their ugly head throughout this podcast uh, moving forward. Okay. I think that's crucial to emphasize is that we definitely ignore when we tell this narrative in the traditional sense, this clashing of ideologies, because we like to not we, but the traditional narrative is that these peoples were uncivilized, etc. They had full societies. There's just, they had complex social relationships. They were a, uh, a civilization of people right so these two civilizations come together and they're completely incompatible with one another and clearly the one with the superior weaponry ends up quote-unquote winning out well and i must stress this that that superior in weaponry does not mean always superior in other ways some of these indigenous societies especially when we look at sub-saharan africa um or some of the indigenous societies in the americas were actually more advanced than their european counterparts in other ways Right, sure. more advanced emotionally, more advanced philosophically, more advanced in uh, being able to achieve sustainability. Isn't that something we're trying to achieve still to this day in Western civilization and failing miserably? Maybe we could have learned a little something. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted a model of sustainable interaction, humans with nature, just rewind 500 years in the Americas. That's yeah, I want to stress do. to the listeners too that it's not all indigenous societies. Before someone loses their shit, yes, I get it. Some of these societies were also imperial and nasty to each other. The Aztecs would be a key example. The Mayan in certain eras, the Maya, excuse me, in certain eras, or even the Inca. So not all of these groups are like these egalitarian societies, but enough of them were that the Europeans could have learned a thing or two. And even when the Europeans ran into societies that were imperial a lot like them, they still found reasons to try and subjugate them. Uh, the Aztec city, uh, Tenochtitlan, it was bigger than just about any city in Spain, and yet because these people were different in other ways, religiously, eventually ethnically, that was still a reason uh, to try and outcompete them. So it, it really doesn't matter even based on the ideology. Uh, the Spanish were going to do what they were going to do. Okay. De Las Casas continues, he says, Yet into this sheepfold, into the land of meek outcasts, there came some Spaniards who immediately behaved like ravening wild beasts, wolves, tiger, tigers, or lions that have been starved for many days. Hispaniola, once so populous, having a population that I estimated to be more than three millions, has now a population of barely 200 persons. Now, De Las Casas' figures are probably off a little bit, like at least the larger one, whether or not Hispaniola ever had... Uh, three million people. He wasn't there when it, on that very first voyage. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that it, there were so many they couldn't count, and by the time he shows up, they can now count 200, shows how complete the ethnic cleansing campaign was already after just, again, 50 years. God, I'm trying so hard to remember a title of this. There's a, such a good book about the whole thing is about this, like the number debate of how many people were killed. The book itself is fantastic, but what I love to think about is the fact that we even debate this number tells us so much about what we're trying to accomplish by celebrating one discourse over another because somehow in our mind like the killing of a hundred thousand natives is justified but the killing of 10 million natives is not like as if like we're trying to apply this rationality to such an irrational era of conquest and just destruction absolutely um the island of Cuba is nearly as long as the distance between Valladolid and Rome. It is now completely depopulated. San Juan, which is Puerto Rico, and Jamaica are two of the largest, most productive, and attractive islands. Both are deserted and devastated. 
We can estimate very surely and truthfully that in the 40 years that have passed with the infernal actions of the Christians, there have been unjustly slain more than 12 million men, women, and children. In truth, I believe, without trying to deceive myself, that the number of the slain is more like 15 million. Again, these are estimates, whether it was that many. Just know that there were so many, millions, and the numbers themselves don't even fully matter at this point, right? We know that there were more people than the Spaniards can count when they showed up. And by the time they do, but in, now in 50 years, they can count them. Right. Yeah. Like, and again, eventually there would be none left. We really, to the best of my knowledge, don't have like full-fledged Taino Arawak to really, uh, to, I mean, any of the mythology, any of the language. We don't have that. We don't have that to, to even draw back on because the ethnic cleansing was so complete. Um, also language, keep in mind, De Las Casas is a priest and now he is actually calling out his group of people. He says, we can estimate very surely and truthfully that in the 40 years that have passed with the infernal actions of the Christians, the Christians, that's clearly a rhetorical device that he's using. Cause he himself, of course, is a Christian. He's a priest. Mm -hmm. So why do you think he used this word? What is he trying to do by basically calling out Christians? I mean, it's he's not, Christian. Yeah. Not very Christian what they're doing. You know what I mean? Okay. Like I said in class, I think this semester when you were doing this, like, what would Jesus do? Not fucking this to the natives in America. You know what I mean? Right. He says their reason for killing and destroying such an infinite number of souls is that the Christians have an ultimate aim, which is to acquire gold and to swell themselves with riches in a very brief time and thus rise to a high estate disproportionate to their metrics. It sh or excuse me, metrics, merits. It should be kept in mind that their insatiable greed and ambition is the greatest ever seen in the world. It is the cause of their villainies. And also, those lands are so rich and felicious, the native people so meek and patient, so easy to, to subject, that our Spaniards have no more consideration for them than beasts. And I say this from my own knowledge of the acts I witnessed, but I should not say than beasts, for thanks be to God that they have treated beasts with some respect. I should say instead like excrement on the public squares. I mean, that's powerful from a 16th century priest. Yeah, De Las Casas is fire right there. Like, that's such a good passage. Um, he says, And never have the Indians and all the Indies committed, committed any act against the Spanish Christians until those Christians have first and many times committed countless cruel aggressions against them or against neighboring nations. So again, the Taino Arawak originally welcomed them, and it was not until, like, numerous uh, acts of oppression and subjugation that they began to resist. And when they get resist, and then, of course, when that resistance starts, of course, they're the bad guys. That's how we frame the language. Like, how dare they fight uh, the Spaniards? Or, of course, when we get to North America, they're savages because they dare fight back, like the dispossession of their land and the ethnic cleansing. Like, what kind of war Warped narrative do we have to tell ourselves? Here's the funny thing, though. We know it's warped because we reproduce it in today's society. We invade another country, they dare fight back, and oh my god, we lose our minds. Like, what would we expect when you invade somewhere else? Yeah. And you don't... of course, the, by the time they started fighting back, their numbers had been reduced so significantly that it, they had no chance, obviously. Yeah, you don't want to lose Spanish conquistadors due to the savage indigenous people. Well, then don't leave Spain and try and go take other people's shit. Exactly. It's that yeah. simple. <laughs> Um, the Spaniards did, uh, the Spaniards, uh, did not contend themselves with what the Indians gave them of their own free will, according to their ability, which was always too little to satisfy enormous appetites for a Christian eats and consumes in one day an amount of food that would suffice to feed three houses inhabited by 10 Indians for a month. I love primary sources, man. It completely debunks like all of the mythology because these were the people that were there. Now, do they likely probably have some of their own biases? But yes, this guy is Spanish. He is Spanish. And Christian calling out Spanish Christians. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the overconsumption of the Europeans is wildly offensive. Right, well, and do we not do that to this day? Oh like, God. I mean, like yeah. as, as as modern Americans, what do we consume? Right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, what I yesterday alone probably would have sufficed somebody else way longer than me for a, a good twenty four hour period. Man, I'm part of. I'm gross too. All right. They behave with such temerity and shamelessness that the most powerful ruler of the islands had to see his own wife raped by a Christian officer. That's powerful. We also know that rape was a common use, or not common use, common practice by the conquistadors for two chief reasons. First and foremost, A, they didn't bring a lot of women with them on these uh, early conquests. And uh, uh, so, of course, you get a bunch of young men uh, all hot and bothered and hormoned up, and, and it's going to lead to awful things. 
uh, especially when they view the people that they are going to be raping as like less than or they've dehumanized them. And then, of course, B, it's part of the dehumanization process. Some would argue that this practice is actually even more derogating than like murder or anything along those lines because you are showing dominance over these other people. You're showing that you are superior and they are subordinate. Um, so that's one of those things that it's it, it, it was constant. We know that it actually – this this example is one of the later examples. We know that it happened like all the time when Columbus actually, after the first journey, went back to Spain with some captives. He comes back, and it had been happening so much that there they had been they, that a resistance had built up against the Spanish, uh, and he has to deal with that on his second journey. Um, okay. The other thing that I want to focus on here in De Las Casas' reading is we find out that uh, they eventually took infants from their mother's breasts. This is, again, these are his words. Snatching them by the legs and pitching them headfirst against the crags or snatching, snatched them by the arms and threw them into the rivers, roaring with laughter and saying as the babies fell into the water, boil there, you offspring of the devil. These are the Spanish conquistadors that we have been conditioned to celebrate. These human beings that were willing to take other people's babies and throw them in rivers or against rocks. I want you as the sociologist to like dissect this for a second. Like how did at one point, like let's just make a cliche, a Spanish conquistador kiss like his wife and kids goodbye in whatever, name a city, uh, 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 Madrid, and then sail across the Atlantic and in a matter of months take other people's babies, children, and throw them into rivers. How could, like, what the hell goes on in that guy's mind? I don't know. This one always gets me because it's so absolutely ridiculous that the only thing that I can possibly think of that could make someone do this is just 100% absolute dehumanization to the point where, like, you don't even view that human child as a human being. You know what I mean? Like, there's no other justifiable, like, reason. I mean, there's no justifiable reason for this behavior. But I can't think of any way that, like, a human being could do this. Like, it's absurd. I mean, we've tried, like, Milgram experiment, the controversial experiment, like, trying to recreate, like, whatever Nazi mentality or something like that. But I must stress, like, here's the thing. The reason I even bring that up, this, like, Nazi thing, is that's, like, the, the, the calling card, the perfect example. Like, the most evil society that ever existed. It's everybody's favorite whipping boy or whipping society. And then, of course, Hitler's, like, the most evil guy. But, I mean, and I'm not going to actually challenge that. that he is awful. Like, that's not the direction we're going. But the fact that we use that as, like, the archetypical example and then ignore what Spanish conquistadors did or British settlers did or or French Jesuit missionaries in certain cases did or any of these other groups. Yeah, I mean, the, the classic reasoning is because Hitler's victims were white. And that's why we tell that story. We don't tell these stories. Where I want, well, we'll save that for a future episode as well because that was absolutely one of the main chief reasons, and I agree with you 100% on that. But we'll save that for a little bit for yeah, a little bit further on. Uh, in well, and I would also argue that the 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 Hitler story is not part of the creation story; mm -hmm. it's part of the victory story, right? 100%. And we even we even obfuscate the victory and like downplay the role of like the Red Army in that yeah. one, right? Like the Russians did nothing. The yeah, Russia did. They won the war. Might yeah. as well not even been there, right? Like, yeah. it's just like were they there? Stalingrad? What? <laughs> Like, that whatever. I yeah, what I don't is. know. I don't know. It was all about storming the beach in Normandy. All right. Is that a city? I don't know. Uh, and, and no offense, actually. The people that uh, – I, I will digress. The people that stormed the beach in Normandy performed one of the most amazing sacrifices of the 20th century. But the fact that we ignore the people that also sacrificed themselves in Stalingrad, that's, I guess, my issue. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Here's the thing that I want to focus on. So they don't find all of the gold that they thought they would find, but they do create wealth. That wealth, of course, is formulated into what a lot of history students were taught but probably don't remember anymore, the Columbian Exchange, which is basically the exchange of people, goods, disease, and ideas between four continents, North America, South America, Europe, and Africa. So when we talk about like exchange of goods, like some goods eventually they find and become novelties. They may not have found the seven cities of gold or in Ponce de Leon's case, the fountain of youth in Florida or whatever, right? But they did acquire wealth through novel, novel products, a couple of those products that are important that were uh, eventually exported, the raw materials, back to the home country in this mercantilist relationship, things like yams, various other tubers, sugar would be huge, uh, eventually indigo, uh, a little bit of rice, and then later on, tobacco. But I want to focus, I want to save tobacco completely for when we get to like Virginia, but yeah, tobacco. So those are some of the goods. Some of the goods flooding in, of course, we know metal work, guns, weapons, guns, germs, and steel, no, um, yeah, 
Those are the things that are making their way in, but also, of course, animals. Like, this is obviously so overlooked, and I'll probably focus on it more when we get to North America, but when you start bringing these European domesticated animals over, they wreak havoc on the natural environment like these invasive species it's not just that they outcompete the other species they completely change the landscape thus making it harder for the indigenous people to survive the way they had become accustomed to surviving it's actually part of the ethnic cleansing campaign to use the north american example right we slaughter bison so we can put cows there well it wasn't just about the cows slaughtering the bison removed the way of the plains indians to survive mm -hmm. so it served two purposes yeah so again um the exchange of goods, uh, people, no, no need for description here. Europeans show up in the quote unquote new world. Indigenous people are taken to other parts of the world, although very few actually survive that journey. Uh, the Pocahontas story is actually a pretty good example. She doesn't make it too long in England. Uh, and then of course, eventually we also have Africans forcefully placed on boats and taken, of course, to the Caribbean as well. And we will detail their story in a future episode. Um, hopefully we get some good guest speakers for that episode. Uh, anyway, that's what we're going to be uh, focusing on the future. What else is exchanged? Disease. And one of the things besides smallpox that makes it here, one of the overlooked diseases that is exchanged in this Colombian exchange. Anyone know? You do know what it is? Mm -hmm. Syphilis. Hmm. Syphilis was brought back to Europe because the Spanish were so freaking rapey. Like, I mean, that's, that's, that was one of the most predominantly spread diseases that was brought from, uh, the, uh, North and South America back to Europe because of the practices of the Spanish conquistadors. Um, ideas. I would say that more in this case, European dominant ideas became the ones to like dominate society. Those are the ideas that would flood into both uh, sub-Saharan and West African society as well as North and South American society. I don't think the Europeans, uh, especially based on their monotheistic beliefs, were willing to accept a whole lot of indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and if they were, they probably would not have uh, – committed the ethnic cleansing campaigns that they felt okay uh, committing, and we would probably be on a much more sustainable society, uh, sustainable trajectory than we are on right now. But anyway, one of the ways that they helped cultivate these goods in this Colombian exchange, that's what I really want to focus on, is they set up a system um, basically called the encomienda system. And, uh, and the way that they uh, justify the encomienda system, first and foremost, is the indigenous people that managed to somehow survive owed some sort of tax. Um, and the, it was paid through the repartimiento. Basically, their tax was labor. And they were put then into the encomienda system, which basically broke uh, uh, all of the new Spanish possessions in New Spain up into territories to be governed by conquistadors, by people that conquered. They got these territories, they paid the crown a fifth, the royal fifth, they got that, and then, of course, they got to create the profits and, and have these landed estates called latifundia. Anyway, to work those when they were not using, of course, African slaves, they would use indigenous people. And especially in, in New Spain, they oftentimes use more uh, indigenous slaves than they would African slaves, um, which will impact the relationship between the English and Spanish later. Um, but the reason I emphasize this is the encomienda system was then racialized because, again, we're going to be talking in this podcast about the birth of North American racism, well, just Western civilization racism. Well, one of the early steps that's often overlooked is the encomienda system where basically – and if you guys are on a computer, you can pull it up right now. It will show you like a perfect pyramid diagram, like just Google encomienda system, and it will give you like a diagram of it. Um, but at the very top of this this system, and they broke people up based on race, were peninsulares, which means people that were pure white from the peninsula. So not only is it about your race, it's about where you were born. Somehow being born in Iberia made you better than other people. So, of course, you are at the top of society. You are an exploiter. You are a conquistador. You have your land. Below the peninsulares in this in this uh, pyramid would be the Crioles, or in America we call them Creole, or I've also heard Criollo. Um, I've heard numerous pronunciations. They're all probably correct or incorrect. I don't really care. But basically, these were people of pure white heritage, but born in the New World. So they're below the peninsulares. And then below them, you have the Mestizos. These would be people that were half indigenous, half pure white. And then below them, you have mulattoes, half white, half African. And then below them, you have pure indigenous people. And at the very bottom, they put African slaves. 
So essentially, they have this tiered hierarchy and they broke it up ethnically and racially. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because this is one of the like earliest time periods where we know race begins to play a prominent role in forced servitude. I emphasize this and I will re-talk about this when we actually talk about slavery on this podcast, but slavery in other societies in the ancient world was not like they had slaves not insinuating that they didn't although the 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 form of slavery was very different than like antebellum antebellum american slavery um it wasn't in many cases nearly as derogating um but that's again we'll save that for the slavery uh part of the podcast but one of the things that they did did not do in many of those societies is make it 100 percent based on race uh race doesn't mean like it was in all of history, someone somewhere can't find some sort of source where like there were Africans that were traded in the Islamic empires or where there were Muslims traded in the Chinese dynasty and served certain roles or vice versa. Sometimes there were Muslims that were served in the kingdom of Mali as like advisors and they were of course forced into servitude. Yes, there were some times where that just happened to work because that happened to be the group of people you were in conflict with, but it didn't become a blanket racial situation until we really reach this pre-enlightenment and then the enlightenment is really going to drive it home. We're going to use our new uh, views on empirical evidence, which Nick is going to spend some time talking about when we get to it um, uh, in a future episode. We start using this need for empirical evidence to basically rationalize the way we see our, our world. So the encomienda system tied to the repartimiento and the latifundia all create like wealth, wealth for these uh, conquistadors now turned governors. Anyway, they're working the people or the survivors at this point so hard, especially the women, that the milk in the breasts of the women, and this is from De Las Casas again, the milk in the breasts of the women with infants dried up, and thus in a short while the infants perished. And since men and women were separated, they could be there could be no marital relations. And the men died in the mines, and the women died on the ranches from the same causes, exhaustion and hunger, and thus was depopulated that island, which had been densely populated. I threw a lot at you right there. What are your just your general thoughts on from encomienda to once we're done raping and killing, then we just work them to death and then we start throw I mean, babies being thrown into water. We already talked about that. But yeah, like, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I don't even know what to say. Like, it's just so ridiculous. It's so gross. I mean, I just think of the plight of the people like you're a woman with a child. You're working to a point where your body is so broken down that you can't even produce milk for your child to survive. Then you have to experience the death of your child, then continue to be worked until you die. Like it's the fact that other human beings could do this to other human beings is just completely ridiculous. And the fact it's so ridiculous that we let them off the hook, that we don't tell this story in this way. We should be telling this story in the K through 12 education system in the United States. Absolutely. I we mean, cannot, I mean, the, the, I mean, how do you let this go? How do you let it go? How do you let it go? And feel good about yourself. Feel like you are some sort of like ethical or moral superiority on how other societies should operate. Yet we're willing to boldface look our youngest generation in the eyes and their origin story, because this is when history starts in the U.S., mm-hmm. is a lie. It is founded on on ethnic cleansing, exploitation, subjugation, right here. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know what to do about it. Like, it's just Yeah, what does that say about us? Yeah, we're terrible. We're losing our minds over, like, modern fake news. Well, we're founded on fake news. Yeah, fake news starts in kindergarten when we start teaching history. Yeah. That's when fake news starts. And it's always been that way, right? Um, Eventually, we reach a point of resistance. The Taino had enough. And they found uh, a leader uh, who we only know, uh, of course— uh, he, well, here, he likely didn't have a last name anyway. I guess I shouldn't have even gone that direction. But his name is Atui. And Atui eventually leads a pseudo-successful resistance on the island of uh, Cuba, at least in De Las Casas' account. And this resistance, it doesn't last for a very long time, but he's able to free some prisoners. And eventually he ends up getting caught alongside some other people that had helped organize this uh, freeing of prisoners and uh, mauling of some Spanish officers and guards. Um, But what we find out, and this is from De Las Casas again in quotes, he says, No, they do not act only because of that, but because they have a God, they greatly worship and they want us to worship that God. And that is why they struggle with us and subject us and kill us. So De Las Casas is basically trying to quote Atui here and Atui is trying to articulate why he thinks the Spanish are being as awful as they are. And he's arguing it's because of their God. He's arguing that it is monotheism. 
I would not argue with him. It might be one of the more controversial controversial things I'm going to say on this podcast, but I will straight up say they are hopped up on Catholicism and they believe what they're doing is okay. So, I mean, we can rationalize in today's society that religion is so many different things and we should all, whatever, respect each other's religion. But I am here and I'm going to say on this podcast that there will be numerous times in this history that we are deconstructing that religion, specifically uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, is responsible for some of the worst atrocities in this nation's history and arguably in world history when we start throwing in crusades and transatlantic slave trades and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm actually going to touch on this when we do the episode on the invention of whiteness in America. But prior to the invention of race, this was the main way that they used to stratify and subjugate other people is using religion was the main division. Yeah. You were either Christian or you basically were not human. And that was it. And it goes back to this idea, like, I get it. I get a modern uh, person would debate me on this. Well, yeah, technically they were just, they're not real Christians. They weren't interpreting the Bible and they're its they not God. They're just men that are interpreting it wrong. Like, I, I'm so exhausted hearing that, like, excuse, right? Basically what we have to assume here is somewhere in there, there's a rich historiography of these religions, especially the monotheisms, the Abrahamic faiths, all three of them, of rationalizing some of the worst atrocities through their belief in their one singular God. Mm-hmm. I, I just, it, 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 it's mind blowing. I mean, blowing. it continues to this day. I don't know anything that's controversial. The things that people do in the name of their religion, the atrocities that they commit to other people, I mean, yeah, I can't. Uh, yeah. 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 So, anyway, whatever. Ah, oh, well, they're just not doing it right. Well, like, whatever. Okay. He had a basket full of gold and jewels, and he said, this is Atui. You see their God here, the God of the Christians? If you agree to it, let us dance for this God. Who knows? It may please the God of the Christians, and they will do us no harm. That's like one of the funniest lines here is he's holding this basket, and he, like he doesn't get it. Like the Between what the Christians are telling him and the way they act, he actually thinks their God is the wealth. That's like the best line in there, right? Nick's going to give us in, I think it's actually in the next episode, he's going to break down a little bit of the Protestant work ethic where there's like, he's going to tie some of this stuff together. But these people aren't even like, that's not even tied to this. This is just a general European purview and that exists to this day, right? Our wealth, if you are like, if you were like an alien and you were observing us, like from the outside and like we say we are these various religions. I'm Buddhist and I'm Taoist and I'm Christian and I'm Muslim and I'm Jewish and I say and I believe all these things. Basically, the aliens would argue like, no, you guys are hypocrites. You spend six and a half days a week thinking about other things, how to make money, how to spend money, what you're going to do with your money, how to save more money, what kind of money are you going to have in the future? If you are like, again, a completely uh, nonpartisan observer, you would argue that this wealth is our God. Mm-hmm. And that's super interesting that Atui was able to, I mean, he was that intuitive to make that kind of statement. Anyway, eventually they catch him and they crucify him. They crucify him with others, right, to make an example out of him. And this crucifixion, he's basically, of course, tied up to a cross and he's burned alive. But before he's burned alive, they give him one one last chance. They send over a different friar. De Las Casas does not agree with this. He's like fighting it all the way. Um, But they send over a Franciscan friar. De Las Casas, by the way, is a Dominican. So there uh, there are like deviations even within Catholicism on this view. But basically they send over a Franciscan. And basically the Franciscan friar um, asks if Atui wants to have his soul saved. And then Atui responds back. He says, he asked the Franciscan friar if Christians all went to heaven. And of course, when told that they did, he said, and this is what Atui says, that he would prefer to go to hell. He would rather go to this hell that's been described to him than spend any more time with Christians. I mean, it it is hell. Their life with the Christians is hell. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the most powerful statements of this entire story is that He's sitting there about to be crucified. He knows he's about to lose his life after all of this, after resisting the Christians, etc. He asks the friar if there are Christians. Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, it's just, it's incredible. Yeah, and again, I, I must stress this to you. This isn't some like sort of like atheist guy. Like this is a priest calling out his own co-religionists here for their just grandiose hypocrisy. And this isn't like a little hypocrisy, like, I don't know, being forbidden to eat non-kosher pork or something and then having whatever, a yeah. sausage. This is, yeah, this yeah. is, this is ethnic cleansing. 
There's no other word for it. Yeah, there's no interpretation of the Bible that that word this is in there and there's permission. I mean, maybe some it. Old Testament stuff with Joshua and then what, yeah, what yeah, but yeah. but I mean, but but it but actually that's the irony here is that Old Testament stuff is actually overwritten by the New Covenant, right? But of course we'll forget that when it's not convenient, right? Anyway. Anyway, uh, here's the thing. De Las Casas went on to write in defense of the Indians in 1550, and basically he's writing to the crown to try and get the crown to step in and be like, what are you doing? I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's super It's super good. It's a great primary source. But there's an interesting quote that I will kind of close out here from De Las Casas, at least our, our section on De Las Casas here. He says, Therefore, uh, when Sepulveda, by word or in his published works, teaches that campaigns against the Indians are lawful, so he's calling out another scholar uh, on this, what does he do except encourage oppressors and provide an opportunity for as many crimes and lamentable evils as these men commit more than anyone would find it possible to believe? So here's one of those things. The Spanish were arguing, um, in this case, Sepulveda is arguing that this is all legal under our ways of doing things, under our laws and all, under our documentation, right? It's all legal. Why do we fall back on law so much as humans? Like what's, especially in Western civilization, this is how we rationalize so much horrible behavior. Well, it's super easy it's in this specific case in this specific era it reinforces the idea that the natives were quote unquote uncivilized because they weren't living under the rule of law also it's so ridiculous just to the the way that people used law and the narrative of law because i've heard this i've even heard this recently from like college students like well it wasn't the land wasn't really the natives. It wasn't their property because they didn't have a concept of property and they didn't have like the concept of law. So it legally wasn't their land. And I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. You're gross. Yeah, exactly. You're a gross person for saying that. Exactly. Like we are willing to cast aside. And this goes back to an earlier comment I made. Ethics and morals. Even those that are taught to us by our Abrahamic faiths in this case, if we want to pick on the Spaniards, we're willing to cast those aside under the rule of law. So we are like one of the grossest representations of cherry picking what parts of our ideologies, which ideologies, which parts of the ideologies and which parts of the stories tied to those ideologies can rationalize our worst behavior. Yeah, I mean, it's like just how like this is like you tell a first grader this, right? And they're like, (laughs) the mindset of the colonizers is like, well, there's no law that says I can't do this, so it must be illegal. Like, that's not how it works. This is humanity. You know what I'm saying? We're living in a society here, to quote Seinfeld. Yeah, technically, you know, whatever. Let's pick a... The Cherokee had not created, like, all of these fences, and they didn't have, like, a bunch of signed contracts. So when we're forcefully marching them from Georgia to Oklahoma, whatever, it's it's all legal, right? It's all legal. We're not doing... I mean, wow! Technically, actually, that was a horrible example, because the Cherokee actually went to court over this, and there were treaties that were violated, but whatever. I think the listeners get the idea, so I probably should have used an earlier example than the Cherokee, but yeah. Well, I also just want to stress one more thing about the law is the vast majority of our narrative of the country is that law equals freedom, but I cannot stress enough how much throughout the history of this country law has been used to oppress and repress and murder. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, everyone's favorite, like, hero of the civil rights era ended up, like, he was illegal, in jail, multiple times, right? Dr. King, in jail. He was breaking the law. Now, of course, we celebrate him, right? Mm-hmm. Posthumously. Not At only the we- time, the law was used to oppress what he was doing. Right. And yeah. then, of course, he's publicly executed, right? I mean, and that's just an easy example at the top of my head. We've seen this over and over and over again, right? Um. Okay. In the meantime, with most certain harm to his own soul, he is the reason why countless human beings suffering brutal massacres perish forever. That is, men who, though the hidden human brutality of the Spaniards, breathe their last before the hard... But the, but, yeah. Breathe their last before the uh, before they heard the word of God or are fed by Christ's gentle doctrine or are strengthened by the Christian sacraments. What more horrible or unjust occurrence can be imagined than this? So I really butchered that quote. I don't know why I forgot how to read um, for a brief moment there, but let me let me try it one more time. 
In the less human beings suffered brutal massacres, perished forever, that is, men who, through the inhuman brutality of the Spaniards, breathed their last before they heard the word of God, are fed by Christ's gentle doctrine, are strengthened by the Christian sacraments. What more horrible or unjust occurrence can be imagined than this? So basically, again, he's picking on, like, the idea of religion. What are we trying to do? Like, I am a priest. In my job, I read these same gospels, and I read them for their beautiful message, that we are meant to, of course, liberate the mind, liberate these people, save them, present them with a better affirmation. Afterlife. Now, whether or not our listeners believe in that stuff, there here we have, and I picked on it earlier, like these gospels and these people that follow this religion that have used it for negative things, then we must also then uh, uh, celebrate the people like de las Casas who read these same gospels, these same books, and use their religion uh, to basically stand up for people. And so uh, it's apt. It makes a connection to my earlier example just now of Dr. King. But like that's one of those things that should also be celebrated. It's not what the listener, listeners leaving if they're of a rel- certain religious persuasion with like a bad taste in their mouth. Um, but I will say, historically speaking, in this time, De Las Casas is an extreme minority. In fact, the only other person really helping was Antonio Montesinos, who he learned from. And Antonio Montesinos is eventually hunted down by the empire and murdered in Venezuela. So for speaking out against the crown, for committing treason. I mean, I don't know enough about the history of this term and this practice, et cetera, but it's almost as if this is like liberation theology. Like he's using he's using his dogma to try to stop the atrocities that are going on. That, that, so some would argue he is the father of liberation okay. theology. Yeah, I don't know enough about it to know that. Yeah. I kind of assumed, but I think this passage though is key because it demonstrates that he views the natives as human. And that is a stark contrast to every what everyone else, not everyone else, but what is going on and how they are being treated. You don't throw a baby and bash them on a rock if you view them as human. But he clearly does based on his wording. Right. And, and, and like I said, he learned from Montesinos, who one of his famous lines is when you look into their eyes, and I'm paraphrasing now because I don't have his work in front of me. When you look into their eyes, do you not see uh, humanity? Do you not see that they have rational souls, right? Like that's one of those things that, that was really important for these, uh, these architects or these progressors of liberation theology, right? That at this point, they're now using their faith, their belief system, and their interpretation of the word of God to help people, which again is an extreme minority, especially in comparison to like the Franciscans who are just cool watching people get burned on crosses and just saving their souls right before they're, they're lit on fire, right? Like that's, in, that's, that's very important for us to stress. Anyway, so we're going to kind of like wind down a little bit here. I think De Las Casas is like a good, good uh, uh, point for us to wind down. Um, I normally, if I were in a classroom, I'd spend more time like discussing later conquistadors, uh, Cortez and his conquest of the Mexica or the Aztecs uh, throughout, of course, what we, was now central Mexico. I'd probably spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Francisco Pizarro and his conquest of the Inca uh, throughout Peru uh, and really through, through uh, the Amazon. And then maybe even a little bit of time of some Spanish conquistadors that made their way into what we call the modern day United States. Ponce de Leon, I already mentioned in Florida. Uh, local, of course, here, Colorado. Uh, Coronado made it up, of course, uh, as far north as here. And there was a couple others. I think DeSoto, I'm leaving off. But regardless, there are a whole bunch of other people. And here's the thing. I must stress this. They're not heroic explorers. In many cases, they merely reproduced what Columbus had set a template for. Even if Columbus did not like write some sort of grandiose treatise how to commit genocide for dummies like he clearly set the template for these other conquistadors to basically follow and and they did and rationalize they did we know uh, in the last uh, primary source i read from de las casas he's writing all the way in 1550 columbus is long dead by that point in time and the problems and the atrocities are still happening um so I will kind of skip those other conquistadors. They're not directly related to what we are doing in this uh, podcast, Myth is America. Though um, I want to stress that you bring up a good point. This man, Columbus, that we celebrate as the discoverer of America, et cetera, et cetera, should be known for the man that set the template for genocide and exploitation, oppression, et cetera, in the Americas. That's what he did, 100%. So I also want your thoughts on this as we're, again, winding down here towards the end of this episode. Real quickly, why don't we tell this story? Like, I get that, like, a listener's probably, you know, thinking, well, of course we don't tell the story to kindergartners. They don't get to, they don't need to be hearing about, hearing about babies being thrown into rivers. Fine. But why don't we then tell the story like ever when kids are clearly old enough to engage this? I know every one of our listeners is at least aware, if not has read The Diary of Anne Frank and did so sometime around middle school, right? We're okay 
teaching those like horrific and violent things. We're okay throwing our kids in front of a screen and letting them counter strike go each other to death or call of duty each other to death. But oh my God, we can't tell them the truth about how our society was founded because it's a little bit too harsh. I don't believe that for one second. Why don't we tell the story? We don't tell the story because it's still going on to this day. And if we admit that the foundation of this geographical territory was exploitation and murder, and then we continue to tell that narrative, which we'll hopefully do on this podcast of reservations and the trail of tears and et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera. If we actually admit to that, then we are fully responsible for correcting that, and we will never do that. I don't even know that I could follow up. I, I, I think that was a, a great way to kind of close it out. Yes, we do not want to have to deal with the responsibility. We don't have to deal with the responsibility of correcting this behavior. 100%. I, I like it. I like it. You got anything to add before we uh, do a little quick outro here? Um, I was taking notes along the way, but the only thing I have on here that is like we've long passed it, but I have, you brought up like the fact that in like, well, I don't even know, elementary school, I guess. We memorize the year, right? Like you said, there's the cute little rhyme. What, I can't even think of it now. Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1492, etc. And we memorize the names of the boats. And I have written down here, how dumb is that? <laughs> like the year I get kind of, because you're like, okay, that's a significant year for like this country, even if it's just like a significant year for the beginning of oppression. But the name of the boats... How dumb is that? How a waste of intellectual resources is that for the teachers and the students in an elementary school to memorize the name of the fucking boats? Yeah, well, and it goes back to one of uh, Nick's theories on informational knowledge versus uh, operational knowledge. And since it's his theory, I'll kind of like let him uh, uh, ruminate on that for a second. Yeah, so I have this theory that the people that control this narrative have a vested interest in making sure that the citizens do not receive operational knowledge. And what I mean by operational knowledge is knowledge of how society actually works and how to control society. That instead, what they feed the masses is informational knowledge, which is purely knowledge that is just like it says is information. So perhaps, yeah, Jared's right. My own theory can answer this question that we're just merely overloading the elementary school kids with informational knowledge so that they don't actually receive any operational knowledge. So we make them memorize the year we make them memorize the names of the ships we make them memorize this very sterilized narrative that is columbus because if we tell them the actual narrative and we tell them the reasons why they don't hear that narrative then that is actually operational knowledge and that gives them a little bit of insight into how the world works and how populations are controlled and then maybe they can take that a step further and figure out how to liberate themselves from that oppression and that's why we don't tell that information that's it i love it so uh, we will be doing another episode. Um, again, it's going to be linear, which is kind of funny since we, we are low-key celebrating like the circular mindset of indigenous peoples. But it is going to be linear just because it's easier to do it that way. So our next episode will take us – we'll probably we're, – we're done with Spain now because, again, this is about myth as, uh, as America, right, the United States. So we're going to talk about the British settlements uh, first and foremost. We're going to be talking about Jamestown, indentured servitude, and then eventually it probably will segue, needless to say – to uh slavery um so yeah that's it so that's the end of this episode of revolution and ideology and our uh side project myth is america you can catch us online at revolution and or we're on twitter at rev and ideology we are on itunes and all other podcasting applications uh, if you have the time you can take two seconds and go on itunes and give us a rating that will help us grow in the rankings and increase our following, which will be hugely helpful for spreading our message and helping us to spend some more time on this and complete some projects in the future that are related that we have in mind. Uh, once again, I'm Nick Lee. I'm Jared. Until next time.